20 minutes to present? Yeah, that, that'll give us I'm going to do my best. Okay. I'll go fast. Uh, yeah, I can do it. Yeah, I think so. Um, ladies and gentlemen, why don't we get started? I want to welcome you all to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Jeff DeBelco. I have the good fortune of directing our Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Wilson Center, also coordinating our Global Health Initiative. And it is a great pleasure to have uh, today's discussion for us to learn from three folks who've been really immersed for quite a long time in issues of population, health and environment, and the integration of both those challenges in the field, and then there are analytical efforts to understand the connections, and then really from a policy and, and practice intervention perspective, how do, we, how do we tackle these issues in an integrated fashion, recognizing that while it may be our preference and easier to organize our academic departments, our government bureaucracies, our funding streams, our congressional committees along sectors and specific issue areas. Unfortunately, life is not quite so simple. And that uh, particularly when we're talking about areas of the world where uh, populations are struggling in situations of poverty and tremendous development challenges, uh, it's incumbent on us to help uh, as we try to help those folks work through those integrated challenges, because unfortunately uh, they don't have the luxury of having a single sectoral challenge. Um, so we have entitled today's uh, session, Integrated Development of Population, Health, and Environment, Updates from Ethiopia and the Philippines, two countries that, uh, as you will hear, and as I think many of you know, have really been on the front lines of both well, unfortunately, the challenges, uh, but also the responses and, and uh, tackling in some really innovative ways um, some of these really big challenges in the population health environment realm within an integrated development context. Um, a word about the Wilson Center and then the variety of kind of partners and friends who were integral to making this happen. Uh, the Wilson Center, as I know many of you have heard me say before, uh, but it bears repeating, is the former memorial to Woodrow Wilson. He was our only president to have a PhD. So Congress, when he set up, when they set up um, this nonpartisan non-advocacy forum, saw fit to do it in a way that brings the world to scholarship and policy and practice together, so that they could learn from one another. Our environmental change and security program is uh, younger than that. Uh, Congress founded the center in 68. We were founded in 94 to try to understand how environment, population, health development issues were part of a larger foreign policy and security policy mix in some ways productively, some ways counterproductively, but nevertheless try to provide a forum where these different communities could come together and talk. And so in the PHE realm, Certainly, we have some different communities, very different languages, very different toolboxes, timelines, and so part of what we try to do here is provide that forum for discussion. Um, we're very fortunate to have USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health as a partner and longtime supporter in those endeavors. Um, and in that realm, also collaborating with some of the other uh, partners that aid in that, with the Balance Project and PRB uh, being two notable ones, population reference being, being two notable ones in part because of some of the affiliations with our speakers, but also kind of the collaboration of, uh, for a variety of reasons, folks are in town and we kind of all talk and then we can come together with sessions like this. So uh, thank you particularly to Linda and Jason for helping um, make that possible uh, as well. So I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers so that they we have three presentations um, and then uh, have a, a, what I anticipate will be a very active uh, discussion period. Uh, we're going to start um, in the order that they're speaking. Uh, Nagash, Nagash Teklu in the middle, is Executive Director of Population Health Environment Ethiopia Consortium, or PHE Ethiopia, um, as we have uh, we have come to call it. It's been a tremendous resource in really networking a range of NGOs and and um, working with the government uh, in East Africa more broadly um, and, and Ethiopia in particular. Um, and so it's Nagash and I have had a, a virtual relationship for a long time. It's great to finally uh, be um, uh, be in the same room and meet him. He's coming back to the center for a second time. I'm fortunately was, was traveling, but he's been a real leader in um, bringing the experiences of Ethiopia 
uh, into fora like this. He's just come back from Cancun as well, where he participated in a, in a PAI panel on these issues. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from him in terms of what's going on in Ethiopia, and then perhaps we can get a few words about Cancun as well. Uh, following Nagash is Annie Wallace, who's been um, also focused on Ethiopia. Um, as a uh, USAID Global Health Fellow um, and working with the Packard Foundation. I should say AID and Packard Foundation probably if you want two leaders on the donor side in trying to support these kinds of integrated programs, those are the two that you would start with. And so Annie has been working closely with Nagash and the, and the network there and with a portfolio of Packard programs. And so she has done in fact an assessment of um, some of Packard's work in this area, and she's very kindly agreed to share it, both in written form that you can pick up outside, as, as well as her presentation today. So it's terrific to, to welcome Annie. And then finally, Joanne Castro, um, another uh, a figure that's well known to, to us who are working in the PHE realm, and we're very pleased to welcome her back to the center for, I don't know, probably the fourth or fifth time. Joanne is uh, at PATH Foundation Philippines, PATH Philippines, um, where she really leads their, their PHE program. She's part of the Balance Project, and so is a, a terrific tie-in there. Joanne has um, deep experience in the Filipino projects, but also has quite a few uh, experiences consulting and working with other countries in the South-South Dialogue. And so um, it's always terrific to hear um, what uh, she's been working on and uh, m most recently having completed a, a project with the Packard Foundation support. So it's wonderful to welcome Joanne back as well. Uh, a final piece of housekeeping is we're webcasting the event live. What that means for us here in the room is that when it comes to Q&A, please use a microphone that my colleague will bring to you. Um, for those folks online, what it means is you can get the PowerPoint slides online at the same website where you pick up the video. So, Nagash, please, we'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Jeff. <coughs> Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, uh, thank you for the information and uh, introduction. <coughs> uh, I will present uh, some of our PhD successes in country. And uh, as you know, our consortium is almost a three years old institution. So you should expect, based on our age, <coughs> uh, uh, how we started, as you can see, uh, the starting point is the international conference we had in 2007 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, that was sponsored by USAID and uh, Packard, uh, and <coughs> PRB and LEM Ethiopia were responsible for organizing that conference. In that conference, we were able to establish our East African network which uh, Kenya, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Tanzania, uh, and Uganda are organized within that network. At that uh, conference, we were able to establish our ad hoc committee where seven organizations like Engender Health Ethiopia, Addis Ababa University, Arba Mink University, uh, LEM Ethiopia, uh, Horn of Africa Environmental Center uh, were organized to take the initiative to establish the PHE in country in Ethiopia level. And that time uh, they were looking for a coordinator and I was starting that time uh, as a coordinator for the ad hoc committee and for the consortium. Uh, with the ad hoc committee, we had a one-year action plan, but we were able to achieve in six months uh, as we had secured from the beginning fund for the secretariat office and uh, even for establishing our consortium. So uh, we were able to have a general assembly meeting where around 51 organizations were ready to be part of the process. And in that 
first general assembly we had uh, established our consortium with the vision to coordinate uh, PHE activities in country promote PHE integration approaches efforts information sharing networking capacity building and fundraising so since uh, the first general assembly that was held in May 2008, uh, we had uh, strong members from small to big and almost all the networks who were existing in country, like CRDA, PANE, <coughs> NIWA, different on women, on uh, pastoralist forum, all were ready to become members of this consortium as they understand that they have value by being part of this consortium. Uh, as a result, uh, we were able to have different project sites in country. As you can see, uh, we have uh, around 26 now project sites within the country. Uh, you can see we are having in different parts of the country. Some of the sites are older, uh, even they had around five years, uh, like the Ethiopian wetlands that is in western Ethiopia. Some are new that are established after the international conference, mainly with the support of Packard Fund. In addition, uh, we had support from SIDA Sweden, uh, Irish Aid, and others. So uh, these are the organizations that are implementing in different parts, and basically the support is coming from uh, SIDA, Norwegian, from SIDA, Norwegian Development Fund, even balanced from USAID, and strongly from PACAR. What we do in country uh, for PHA awareness activities, one is we have the National Earth Day events for two years, in the last two years, uh, and we raise issues of integration in addition to climate change issues. We have the World Environment Day, the World Population Day, and we also organize field visits to all our PHE sites, not only to see success stories, even to see challenges we have in country uh, based on the uh, climate change impacts we have in country or deforestation, degradation of land, anything related to our activity. We have also uh, presented on PHE uh, approaches locally and internationally. These are the activities we have for awareness creation in country. In information sharing and networking, uh, you might have seen our website. We have PHE TPN uh, website, which Uh, we have also a newsletter we publish every four months. We have also uh, a spotlight where we highlight success stories and challenges of individual project sites and organizations. Uh, you can access them in our website. They are in the front homepage. Uh, we also produce brochures on PHE and it's a consortium. Uh, that addresses the concept, the approach, everything. Uh, we also participate we, we in different networks and partnerships like the Vetivar Grass Network, the Ethio uh, Wetlands Network, Family Planning uh, Group, and the Climate Change Civil Society Network, and different forums. Yeah. Uh, this is our uh, website, which 
starts by defining the concept of PHE and we have publications. We have every time new publications. For example, about Cancun related, you can see the latest uh, documents that address about the COP16, what was agreed on the different discussion points uh, concerning the Kyoto Protocol and others. <coughs> Uh, we also facilitated capacity building activities for our members and partners like PHE project design. How do we uh, integrate PHE? How do we design it? What are the methodologies? Uh, how do we monitor and evaluate integrated projects? Do we use the same indicators like the family planning, the environment, or do we use the integrated or value added? So we had uh, a monitoring and evaluation uh, capacity building training, policy communications. How do we develop evidence that could convince our policy makers? Uh, how do we uh, collect data? In addition, uh, we are sharing resources that we can generate from internet. Uh, because many of our members, they may not be aware what kind of resources they have to use or to integrate. So we have trainings in these uh, four categories in the last two years. We have international partners, which many of you are part of this list. Uh, our strong supporters, Packard Foundation, Oak Foundation, Henry Ball Foundation, some European and American organizations, Eastern African PHE Group, uh, USAID Washington, thanks to Heather, she is our strong pass supporter, PRB, PAI, Global Health Fellowship Program, Woodrow Wilson Center, which they have invited me for the second time, Balanced Project, the Sera Club, uh, the Population Climate Change Alliance Group, which is from U.S. and from Europe and from the South, uh, our consortium. So we want to make it meaningful partnership, uh, and it's a good start for us. So what are the lessons up to now learned from the PHR approach we have in country? One thing we are very sure is Ethiopia, it has the potential of integrating projects. There is a big demand, there is a big uh, interest on the integration approach because it has added value to what every organization is doing. Uh, community ownership and participation are very, very critical and essential things we need to follow, and that is why it is giving us uh, strengths and support within our members and partners. The international support is very significant and important. Without that, uh, the development we secured up to now cannot be achieved, so that should be also be well recognized. Uh, the population and climate connection are easily seen in Ethiopia. Why? We have 85 million people, which is fast uh, growth. In, a, in addition, we have the most degraded, the most deforested, maternal mortality high in everything. So you can see the climate impact in addition how it is being aggravated it was ugly when it is added through the effects of the climate change it is highly aggravated so you can easily see how climate and population is interrelated in Ethiopia and when we raise the population issue in relation to climate we are not really concerned as it useful for mitigation. 
our concern is in relation to adaptation how to build resilience considering the population issue is very important and critical in addition well this is not easily achieved in country it is through the networks initiative and work so the ph etps consortium capacity still needs uh, support to strengthen it so that we can maintain the achievements we have in country in addition we have promising policy developments in country at this moment Ethiopia just last week has endorsed through its parliament a five years uh, growth and transformation plan this is that is replacing the past day program we had in country and in that strategy we have a very ambitious plans like family planning goal to have CPR coverage to reach after five years six, 65 percent which is a big 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 ambitious target uh, and this is a big success for us even to target that way takes maternal and child mortality seriously so to minimize to the maximum uh, if possible if possible even to minimize it to the level of 300 400 uh, within 100,000 calls for zero emissions in 2025 and green economy uh, and you know some of those results are the result of the advocacy work of all civil society organizations who were uh, lobbying and advocating to this kind of change thanks the government has taken it seriously and incorporated almost almost all issues we were raising now it is time how we can support in the implementation area and we are part of this process even in the discussions we have participated we have contributed in injecting some of the issues we want to be incorporated in the in the gtp plan uh, <coughs> major challenges we face uh, in pushing our principles and cause one is limited capacity and funding implementing organizations including the consortium uh, for example some of the big organizations in country like crda they have reached to the level they get big amount of funds even 50 ta 50 million or something they, that could they could channel it to member organizations we are not at that level even for our existence we are bringing from different stakeholders or donors i listed before and uh, our existence is very challenging uh, still we need big need for monitoring and evaluation we are starting but it is time to strongly gather data that could show our success on the ground so that we can have strong evidence to convince that PH approach is really workable and it adds value in country. We need to sustain the opportunity and expect expectation created in country and this is with your support we can achieve that. In addition we need the Eastern African PH network that was established in uh, 2007 in Addis Ababa to be organized and contribute uh, its role by having existence, strong existence. What can you do? Uh, I think you can do a lot. One, you can help us capitalize on the good opportunities created in Ethiopia. Uh, be it on how we are
creating resilience in climate change adaptation by community-based adaptation mechanisms, how our PH is con contributing to the resilience, how our PH approach is contributing to the growth plan in country, to development, to poverty alleviation. So your help is very important. We are planning to have our fifth general assembly in mid-March. We need you to join us to be part of our general assembly. And we are organizing it in a way we can share experience what's happening in PHE internationally. How is our PHE approach by the different organizations who are implementing on the ground? What is their specialty, each organization, in implementing the PHE approach? And how is PHE uh, incorporating the issue of youth, gender, climate change, and livelihood, practically? And we are also planning to have field visit to LEM site and to Gypsido site within the radius of 100 kilometers. So please join us. Uh, you will benefit. You will learn a lot from us. The, let us discuss in this session how to realize the vision of the Eastern African PHE network practically. Is it possible? What can you support to make it practical. Lastly, come visit us and learn in Ethiopia. I thank you. Thank you very much, Nagash. And to continue on the Ethiopia focus, we'll turn it to, to Annie. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Nagash. I, um, as Jeff had said, I um, was a, peace, a population health and environment technical advisor <laughs> in um, Ethiopia working out of the Dave and Lucille Packard Foundation's Population and Reproductive Health Program. And my fellowship, or my te as a technical advisor, I was working as a um, USAID-funded global health fellow. Um, and my work that I was doing, I was providing technical assistance to the Packard Foundation's um, grantees that had received funding for their integrated population health and environment projects. So what I'm going to talk to you about today that Jeff already um, alluded to is a, the report that I wrote based just uh, basically an informal assessment of the Packard grantees um, work in Ethiopia and what I did is I reviewed all of the documents that they had submitted to the Packard Foundation their proposals their reports articles that had been written and then I also did interviews with their um, staff and that included the sub grantees of CCRDA and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you an overview of the Packard's PHE work in um, as quickly as I can in my time slot. So the Packard Foundation began investing in integrated population and environment work in Ethiopia in 2001. And this was in response to their population and environment initiative, which was really a, a focus on trying to reduce population growth and Im its impact on um, the environment in the beginning. And they started investing in the Population Environment Initiative in Ethiopia with LEM Ethiopia, which is a conservation organization. And the initial project was funded for three years, and it received um, funding for a second phase and actually um, continued funding th into the 2007 when Packard moved, evolved into more of a population health and environment approach. And also their focus became less on pop reducing population growth and, and the pressure on the environment and more focused on how can an in integrated approach help them achieve their reproductive health and family planning goals in Ethiopia. And so the first investment that the Packard Foundation made in, pop in PHE in Ethiopia was partnering with USAID and PRB and LEM Ethiopia to put on the International Population Health and Environment Con Conference that Nagash talked about. And one of the outcomes from this conference was Packard, the Packard Foundation committing to fund 
projects, PHE projects in Ethiopia. And as a result, they funded six PHE projects in Ethiopia. Three of them were existing adolescent reproductive health projects that um, they felt would be interesting to see if an integrated approach would help them achieve their adolescent reproductive health and family planning goals. Um, one of them was the seed funding for the network, and um, another one was a con the conservation organization LEM Ethiopia, which evolved from their population and environment initiative to a population health and environment project. And finally, the sixth um, grant was actually reallocation of funds from within and gender health to provide funding for a conservation project in the Bali Mountains by Melka Ethiopia. And so you've already seen uh, the, basically the same map, but these are just the um, Packard projects. And because of the time limitations, I'm not going to go into too much detail about each project's interventions, but I'm just going to give you a quick overview here of um, the CCRDA, which is, is this a pointer? CCRDA, which is right there. That is the Consortium for Christian Relief Development Associations, and that's actually a management organization that administered funds to nine implementing organizations within the, the Southern Nationalities, Nations, Peoples region. Um, and it, is one of, it was one of the existing adolescent reproductive health projects in, that was working with Packard that received funding for PHE. The Garagi Peoples Self-Development Organization um, was also one of the adolescent reproductive health projects that received funding to expand their pro existing project into an integrated PHE project. And REST, our Relief, so Relief Society of Tigray, was also one of those existing adolescent reproductive health projects. Um, LEM Ethiopia, we've already talked about, is a conservation organization that has been partnering with Packard for a while on integrated approaches. And finally, Melka Ethiopia, the other conservation organization receiving Packard funding or utilizing Packard, Packard funds to implement a PHE project. So an overall, an overall, some, an overall review of what the types of integration were occurring or are occurring in Ethiopia with the Packard grantee projects. Um, how are they integrating their, their work? Well, one example is all of the projects have created community level planning committees, and these include health extension workers or the health office, they include representatives from the education office, they include representatives from the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, um, women's associations, youth and sports. And what they're doing is they basically were formed by the project with, with representatives from these government organizations to um, help with monitoring of the implementing of the project and planning of the interve interventions as well. The, also, all of the projects are integrating the government extension programs. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like, the extension programs are out of the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture and um, Rural Development. And they have paid uh, government employees that are extension workers that go out into the communities. And what they have is they have two health extension workers for each Kabele, which an, a group of Kabeles makes up one warida, which is the smallest unit of local government in Ethiopia. And there are two, there's three development agents from the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development in each Kabele, and they focus on livestock, um, agriculture, and natural resources education. And so what normally what this looks like is the health extension workers, they go into the community and they go to a group of houses or a household and they talk about, they deliver their health extension package. And in general, they're delivering it to women. And when you see the development agents going into the communities, they're going and talking to the farmers, talking about agriculture and cattle raising and, um, and natural resources, and in general, they're talking to men. And so how these projects have, inter ha have integrated these government extension programs is they have brought together the health office and they've brought together the, um, the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development and come up with some planning for these extension workers so they can come up with integrated messages and implement their community conversations in an integrated manner together and, um, and so therefore, that when they're going out into the communities, instead of seeing two different community con conversations, you're seeing one community conversations with the development agents and the, ag the health extension workers, and you're seeing a group of women and men talking about health issues and population or health and environment issues. So that's how the integration is happening, and all of the projects are implementing um, this, this type of integration in their projects. Also, there are integrated PHE youth clubs. Um, all of the organizations, all of the uh, schools 
require um, a certain amount of youth clubs, and they usually are girls clubs, health clubs, and environment or for and or forestry youth clubs. And in general, the boys are in the environment and forestry, and in, the girls are in the um, health and girls clubs. So what they've done is they've integrated these these clubs, so all of them are having these discussions together. And um, finally, through um, REST, they're doing a watershed planning process where they work at the Cabele level with the extension workers on what are the community development issues that are needed, and they create a plan for that Cabele, which go, all of the Cabeles submit that to the, at the WARIDA, where they create a WARIDA level watershed plan. So the integration happens at the very beginning of the planning with all of the actors involved, all the way down to the extension workers, and then the implementation is based off of, what that, uh, off of that plan, that approved plan. So to give you, I'm, in my report I have a, a lot more results reported, but I'm going to try and give you a quick overview of some of the results that I feel are, are linked to some of the integrated activities that are occurring in these projects. With the consortium, with CCRDA, um, they are reporting that teachers are more able to allocate more time to academic affairs, and they're attributing this to the integrated PHE youth clubs, because instead of having one teacher for all of the different youth clubs, they have one teacher for one club, and they're able to rotate their time so they can spend more time focusing on academic affairs. Um, they're also reporting more male involvement in girls' club activities, and they're attributing this to the PHE clubs because they're talking about girls' issues in these PHE clubs because they're all having the conversations at the same time. And also they're reporting a um, reduce in gender-based violence in and around the schools, and they're attributing this possibly to the male involvement and also the integrated discussions through the PHE clubs. Um, improved parent-child communication, which they're attributing to the the PHE clubs that are encouraging the youth to go home and ask their family, talk to their families about their family and family economy, health, and livelihoods. And at the same time, the parents are discussing with development agents and health extension workers. So hitting it from both sides, it's creating what they believe this improved parent-child communication that's being reported. Also, cost efficiencies within government offices are being reported. Um, because the health extension workers and the development agent, agents are traveling together, so saving transportation costs, and also instead of having two community conversations, they're having one community conversation. So that's improving their costs. With Gypsy Doe, they are reporting, among many things, increased women's involvement in environmental rehabilitation activities, which they're belie they believe are attributed to the, the integrated community conversations with the health extension and development agents, because now women are actually being involved in these discussions, and also they ha they're doing environmentally friendly livelihood skill building activities that are targeting women as well. Um, they're, inc they're reporting increased male involvement in family planning, and they're attributing this to the integrated conversations um, with um, the health extension workers and development agents because the men are actually involved in the health extension package now and information. And finally, they're reporting increased um, family planning users. They've actually reported that in 2008, when the project started, the CPR rate wa the CPR was 21 percent, and now they're saying at the at the 2010, it's 33 percent, and that's based off of health office documents and um, interviews with health extension workers and community members. Lem Ethiopia is also re reporting an increased CPR by 20 percent in their project, and through the, from the same sources, um, and they did a they did a joint evaluation with the health, with the government offices. They also are reporting increased clients at health, the health post are improving the time efficiency of the health extension workers because now the health extension workers don't have to go out to each house at quite as much because there seems to be more buy-in from the entire household and entire family to come in and go to the health post and access these health services. And also they're reporting religious leader, that religious leader support and buy-in and family planning services is actually increasing the community support and buy-in for family planning services. And um, they, the messages that they've been using are really connecting livelihood and to um, the, the use of family planning and limiting, your, um, spa limiting and spacing your births. And this is creating, um, and when they, with the, re the religious leader buy-in comes in, then the communities definitely respond to that. Um, and finally, they're saying that they need to address um, some tabo taboos that are hindering a lot of single youth from um, accessing family planning services. They have. They have um, women of reproductive age that are married coming in and using, the repro using reproductive health services, but a lot of youth, there's still rumors that contraception um, makes them infertile or some other taboos and um, misinformation. And so they, they're looking at um, integrating more 
into their environmentally friendly livelihood skill building activities some more messages that try and dispel some of the misinformation. Melka Ethiopia is also reporting that Islamic leaders support and buy-in for family planning is increasing the community support and buy-in for family planning services and they have in their reports quotes from their re religious leaders where they're targeting in the community conversations saying you know our livelihoods are affected when we have too when we have too many mouths to feed we're able to make, you're able to have a um, a better fa family income and you're also able to have more resources if you limit your um, family size or and space your births so therefore um, family planning and reproductive health services make sense um, they're also reporting in that in the same thing that CCRDA was reporting that they're having cost efficiencies from the extension worker partnerships and um, for Melka as a as a primarily a conservation organization they're reporting um, create new partnership opportunities through Engender Health and also with Pathfinder International and also the health offices that they they previously they were not partnering with in the area that they're working. The Relief Society of T Tigray is reporting er that, that they're preventing early marriages and they think this is from the integrated conversations occurring with the PHE clubs and also with the um, integrated health extension and um, development agent discussions. Um, and they're also reporting increased male involvement in plan family planning directly associated with the development agents being more engaged in the health extension package, specifically talking about family planning and livelihood. So how I structured my recommendations is I asked the practitioners that I interviewed, and I was talking to field staff that they came in, they either came into Addis or I went into their offices to talk to them about the PHE approach and their projects, but also I wanted to ask, I asked them at the end of their interviews, if what advice or recommendations do they have for other practitioners interested in PHE or already working in PHE? And their recommendations included planning for self-sustaining programs, and this really came from, they have their, their implementation committees and the monitoring com community level committees, and they have their, um, and they're working really closely with the, with the local government offices, but they're not getting any commit financial commitments for from the from the local offices so while there's buy-in for this approach from the local offices there isn't funding being planned into the local budgets and they're really attributing this to the the local governments just believe more money is going to come in to implement these projects and so they 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 want more help and and th thinking strategically on how to plan for more sustainable programming and the next um, recommendation is very similar, encouraging integration at the local government level Woreda. So trying to really align their project um, planning processes with local government planning processes and also trying to get involved in, the, in, how, in aligning with, with policies, local, local policies, but then also um, hopefully working towards budget allocations for the, for the sustainability of the work. Also, um, they're encouraging that the projects target their education and awareness also to decision makers and leaders to create this buy-in and hopefully lead to more sustainability of the projects and the integrated approaches. Um, and they're also advising practitioners not to be intimidated by a, trying to adopt a whole new project because it's a PHE. Look at what they're already doing and look at how they feel the integration approach could help them achieve their existing go their goals of their existing work because a lot of them initially were, were scared that you know if they're working in health that all of a sudden they would have to become environment experts and vice versa and they now that they've been working in the you know there's been so much so much capacity building going on with these organizations they understand that they don't need to reinvent the wheel when they're doing these PHE projects um, they also are advising that practitioners need to learn how to implement policies there seemed to be in the, especially in the interviews that I was doing uh, there wasn't consensus on which policies were the enabling policies for uh, that enabled P integrated PHE work. Some people, some people thought certain policies enabled the PHE work. Others thought that they really focused on single sector work. And so, more education on how, what those policies are that enable the, the work, but then also how to implement those policies. Um, and then once again, they're encouraging to con stay connected through the PHE network through the PHE Ethiopia Consortium. Um, access the capacity building and knowledge sharing, but also staying connected to other practitioners in country through the network. Um, involving communities in the planning, implementing, and monitoring. A lot of, especially a lot of the sub-grantees of CCRDA felt that the, the initial project design was a very top-down approach. And this was attributed probably to the fact that CCRDA 
wanted to make sure that everybody understood what PHE was and that there was not too much change into the adolescent reproductive health focus, but more looking at how to integrate within those projects. And, um, and now that they understand, the leadership understands PHE and the field staff understand integration, they now want to be able to, in the next phases, involve the community more in the um, project planning and implementing. Um, they also are, um, are saying you need to target youth. Um, a lot, granted, a lot, most of these projects are adolescent reproductive health projects, but also they're saying that youth are the next leaders, and by targeting youth, you can get them to think more strategically about their livelihoods and their ho how they want their future household sizes to affect their livelihoods and making these connections. Um, developing and implementing monitoring and evaluation processes, a lot of organizations felt like they didn't have adequate enough funding to do m and &E work, and I know that this is a message that Nagash was saying, and you're gonna hear it a couple more times from me before I finish speaking. Um, monitoring and evaluation, they, they know that they need to be collecting data and being able to communicate the results in a better way so they can get more funding for these approaches, because they feel like they're really working, but they're not implementing good m and &E processes, and they know it. Um, also, they feel like in the, pro in the project planning process, they, you need to plan to tell your project story so you can really sell the good work that you're doing. Um, and then finally, they recommend that a national level committee of government agency representatives be need, is needed to mirror the local level implementer committee. And they did recommend that this would happen through the PHE Ethiopia Consortium to help kind of enable the whole process of the um, local level government um, committees at a, having that at the national level as well. So then I also asked them for recommendations for donors. And they were saying support PHE awareness and capacity building activities. And there have been a lot of um, capacity building activities, as Nagash said. There's been um, measure evaluation and balanced projects M&E work, um, the USA, USAID's project design um, workshop, PHE policy communications by PRB, balanced projects PHE, IEC messages and materials, and there still needs to be more capacity building. There's also, I mean, I've been there as follow-up for these projects, but I'm not there anymore. And there needs to be a more sustainable strategy for how to, how to do follow-up for these kinds of workshops, but then also how to start creating in-country technical assistance so people can follow up within, in, within country folks that do have this experience and do have this expertise. Um, they're also recommending that increased geographic coverage of PHE activities. Right now, the Packard Foundation works within four regions, and there are other regions that are not receiving funding for integrated approaches necessarily that are definitely vulnerable to climate change and um, food insecurity that they feel would really benefit from an integrated PHE approach. Um, stronger communication and collaboration among donors, and they're really thinking if a donor, looking at pooling funds to, do, to achieve integrated approaches in, in implementing communities, if a donor is focusing more on environment or climate change and another one's focusing more on health, but they, ha they want to achieve results in a certain community, pool your funds and let's do an integrated, uh, integrated project together. And that's what the practitioners are recommending to donors. They're also recommending that um, donors should be willing to be educated about new approaches. So being open to the PHE approach and learning about integration and being willing to then ho hopefully to collaborate with other donors. And then finally support documentation and monitoring evaluation efforts. Um, right, right now there's just, like I said, a lot of the organizations are saying that they do not have enough money to really implement good quality M&E activities, and they feel like it, there should be a priority from the donor also allocating enough funds, but then also asking for the right information. And so that requires some education of donors as well. And finally, from my interviews and all of the research that I did and also the work that I was doing in Ethiopia, I have created a list of my recommendations. Um, once again, capacity building. <laughs> Um, and, but I do think that we need to be much more strategic in how we're doing our capacity building. I th capacity building. I think that the that doing workshops is really important, but then also thinking of strategic follow-up, um, identifying ways to build the capacity of the network, and, or organizations within the network that have maybe point people that would be great tech people for technical assistance. Also providing tech, um, training of trainers. So we can start thinking about the sustainability of this technical assistance and experience sharing, because there's a great resource in the PHE Ethiopia Consortium. Also improved pre-planning and monitoring and evaluation is needed. Um, there needs to be 
more funding a allocated for monitoring and evaluation. And I know that I keep saying that, so I'm not going to go into too much more detail, but we need to be thinking about that, thinking about the skill building, but also offering enough money, but then teaching people how to, trans how to do data collection, but then how to translate those results into good success stories or lessons learned. Um, improving, improve the understanding of PHE and consensus is needed. And this is important because we have, we've had a lot of trainings about PHE and a lot of the leadership are the ones that are going to this training. And then when you talk to the field staff, you can ask them about the PHE approach and they're just trying to figure out where their project fits into PHE. But then when you ask them where the integration is in their project, they can identify it directly. And they know that their, their project has the label of a PHE project, but the knowledge of what a PHE project and why their project fits into this mold isn't trickling down from the leadership. So really targeting the field staff is important, or at least creating mechanisms for that trickle down of information from those that are trained in um, what PHE is. Also better planning for sustainability of projects is needed. I talked about this with the funding and, and trying to align more with um, the local government mechanisms. And then finally, um, following up on specific reported findings that may be lessons learned. I think that the role of religious leader buy-in and um, family planning is really interesting and how PHE has played a role in encourage in creating that buy-in would be really interesting to follow up on. Also, um, the reported increases in CPR, is that attri really attributed to the PHE approach or what else has been going on in that community that could possibly have increased the CPR? Um, the PHE link to improved parent-child relationships how the targeting youth at the PHE clubs and through the, the adults at the, through the extension program, is that really helping to create better communication and possibly helping to prevent early child marriage? Um, what are some of the other, other issues that it would be really interesting to find out um, the PHE link to those? Also, what are the actual cost efficiencies that for organizations and government offices? Is this linked to the to the, actually the integration of these, um, these extension programs or what else is going on in these offices that could be co possibly be creating these cost efficiencies. And then finally, um, how is PHE really linked to livelihood improvement in Ethiopia? Uh, that's one of the messages that all of the extension workers are reporting and what is that linkage, linkage? That would be really interesting to know. So that is the 40 page report <laughs> in a nutshell. If you have any questions, please, um, I look forward to answering them when we, um, after Joanne's presentation. Thank you very much, Annie. As we mentioned, uh, for the report that she's referring to is available out here, and then for those watching online, there's a link to the PDF on the website as well. Joanne, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, it's, it looks great on the screen here on the computer. I'm not, sh I'm not sure what special thing we did to uh, make that. There we go. Great. Kick the plug. That's the lesson, right? <laughs> thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, thank you, Jeff, again for this opportunity to be able to share with you experiences in the Philippines, particularly on the project which was implemented after um, the Integrated Population and Coastal Resource Management. It's also funded by Packard Foundation, um, and it's good to see you know, all of the presentations earlier which had similar funding as Jeff mentioned. The goal of the project is, or was, to alleviate poverty and improve food security in high growth hotspot areas of the Philippines to improve capacity of the local governments to implement integrated approaches to reproductive health management and natural resource management. The population uh, poverty environment project, otherwise known as PPE project, actually implemented the best approaches that we have learned in two projects that preceded this project. So, the very first PHE project that was implemented by PATH Foundation Philippines is the, the IPOC form, or the Integrated Population and Coastal Resource Management. It was a six-year project, which was also supported by Packard Foundation. 
the project um, developed and designed the private sector PHE model. So we work with um, non-government organizations, we work with cooperatives, we work with small entrepreneurs to implement the bulk of the service delivery of the project. And we work with the municipal or the local governments to provide sustainability and for referral system of the project. So that was one of the strategic approach that we use in the PPE project. So we adopted IPOPCORM's best practices in PHE service delivery for use by the local government units. So it was, um, the PPE project was a shorter project and it was also a means for us to scale up the lessons learned that we've learned from our six years experience with the IPOP form. So in terms of the community-based system, we involved, like what we did in IPOP form, community volunteers, both adults and youth, as PHE peer educators to create a demand for family planning um, uh, methods. And then we work with the small entrepreneurs and community-based distribution of family planning products to provide a supply. And then we work with the local government uh, for the referral systems. So we created the linkage between peer educators, the community-based distributors, and with the government health system to develop a functional referral system from being educated, increased awareness to getting the supplies, and for other family planning and reproductive health needs, being able to get that from the government health service systems. There was also another project which we called Alternative Advocacy Project. Um, it was a scale up. We work with, um, with policy makers to be able to scale up PHE in terms of advocacy. So we work with uh, decision makers at the local governments and we look at frameworks at the national level to be able to um, look for entry points where PHE integration can, be, um, can come in. And we promoted RH management as an integral component of coastal resource management for food security, which means that um, it is reproductive health is essential and is connected to natural resource management. We enhance and ultimately um, we promoted also reproductive health management as the one that enhances and ultimately improves conservation objectives. And while addressing uh, also a root cause of resource degradation and human poverty. So these were the the entry points wherein we were able to promote reproductive health component both at the national and sub-national levels. So with the alternative advocacy project, we were able to put in PHE into an ecosystem-based management of natural resources. And uh, also at the national level, we work with, an, um, with the National Anti-Poverty Commission to be able to identify what were the priority areas for hunger mitigation and consider the poorest of the poor uh, provinces in the Philippines. So both of these approaches in terms of identifying the areas where we work in and also implementing um, the community-based approach were the same strategic approach that we use for the population uh, for the PPE project. Um, that the duration of the project was in 2008 to 2010. Uh, the public-private partnership which uh, we established we're actually working with 22 local government units located in high biodiversity areas and also considered as the poorest of the poor provinces in the Philippines. To be able to scale up this, um, this project, we work with the League of Pinas Municipality of the Philippines. This is an association of all elected municipal mayors, which is composed of close to 2,000 municipal mayors in the Philippines. And uh, we signed a memorandum of agreement with them for them to be able to uh, piggyback so that we can piggyback PHE into an IEC campaign which they entitled for, prog for Less Means Progress. So that was their family planning ca campaign. So that was 
the entry point for the PH integration and we were able to work very closely with the different mayors. So it was actually an enabling process to be able to scale up the local government, the public sector PHE model that we did under this project. And particularly working in areas that were identified by the national government as the poorest of the poor. So what they did was they ranked um, the municipalities and provinces that have high, that were high priority, and then a second priority and a third priority. So most of the areas that we worked with were considered fifth or sixth class municipalities. So these were located in very remote areas that were also um, in high biodiversity areas and high population um, uh, growth rates. We did work with the private sector for the contraceptive supplies because we also work um, to increase awareness. And then um, PATH Foundation as, as the one that, uh, uh, as a non-government organizations to be able to provide an umbrella for all the initiatives that we did on the ground and at the national level. These are the sites that we work uh, in. Uh, there are 22 um, remote and also considered the, the priority provinces in these areas. They're located in key three key bioregions. So this is also the very first time for PATH Foundation to be able to work in watershed areas. So, this one, this, this was the very first initiative that we had uh, uh, for the watershed areas, implementing the same approach and um, the same activities that we did in the coastal communities. We continued to work um, in another key bioregion, which is the Danahonbak, composed of 19 municipalities in four provinces that had um, that were um, that had over a million people dependent on the Nahon Bay. It's a very important ecosystem because it's one of the only two double barrier reefs in Asia and the Pacific. And then um, the other bioregion that we worked in was in um, the Verde Island, which uh, is being considered the center of the center for species uh, um, biodiversity or speciation, that's how they call it. So it is um, bounded by four provinces and we work in at least two provinces that were um, fronting one of the key areas, the Verde Island region, uh, Verde Island wherein we implemented uh, the population poverty environment leaves. The project worked, uh, worked towards achieving the short-term outcomes and eventually reaching um, the goal of the project. And one was to uh, work towards political commitment and support generated for integrated approaches to poverty alleviation that incorporates reproductive health strategies. This was not too different from what we did in the IPOC form, but we were able to look at the framework of poverty alleviation, which is the main vision of most of the municipalities that we work in, alleviate poverty uh, in, in their areas. The second um, short-term outcome is uh, we provided capacity building of the, at the provincial and the municipal level governments. Uh, so what we did in IPOP form was we work in hotspots. So we work in selected uh, villages. In the, uh, in the PPE project, we work at the municipal level to be able to provide more coverage, both in the coastal villages, in, in the forest uh, villages that they had, or the upland villages. And then thirdly, um, is the LG capacity created to establish and sustain community-based family planning systems. So in here, in the IPOC form, what we did was train NGOs as trainers. This time we trained the local governments who are already paid for by, by, by the national government or the, by the local governments to be able to deliver the capacity building activities and identify the peer educators and the uh, youth peer educators and the community-based systems 
in their own areas and be able to monitor them beyond the project life. So that is essentially how how we implemented uh, differently IPOP form and uh, and the PPE in terms of uh, um, community-based systems. Some of the project inputs are the key project inputs. Um, we provided orientation and action planning work uh, workshops for local government personnel, which included both sectors from the environment, from the agriculture, and from uh, the health sectors. We mentored the local chief executives um, uh, by the PhD champions, the LGU fro leaders from the previous uh, IPA farm projects were also the ones who were um, encouraging the new champions to be able to adopt the PHE uh, approach. Partnership and franchisee arrangement were facilitated between the local governments and the private sector suppliers for family planning products. So if before we work with the non-government organizations to be able to get that, uh, the, the franchisee arrangements or through PATH Foundation, it was now an investment by the local governments to be able to um, access to have access to the franchise arrangement and work closely with the, the private sector to be able to provide family pl planning commodities to those who who cannot afford or also those who have um, who like to have family planning and have little money to be able to get that so in terms of the market it was wider because the government would have some family planning commodities to those who cannot really afford but with the social marketing arrangement, then we are able to get um, more people um, who can go and buy the commodities at the community-based distribution at a cost. And then build, we also built capacity for local government and the RHU staff to establish and maintain community-based family planning systems. I think this is one of the most important achievements that we see uh, and a project input that's very necessary and I'm reminded of the recommendation of Annie earlier that they become part of the pre-planning pre activities um, and making them know that the project is only for a limited time. And so whatever initiatives that you provide during the project um, is actually an investment and, and, um, and a partnership that we can, they can take advantage of so that they're able to continue and sustain the gains that were provided during the duration of the project, even beyond uh, uh, the project life. So most, while we ended IPOP Corp and the PPE project, we still continue to have partnerships with them. They have maintained most of the initiatives that we have provided, and uh, they remain to be the learning sites for PHE integration in country and for um, the international community. For two years, here are the project outputs. We have, uh, while we, do, we work with 22 municipalities, we actually have 27 annual investment plans. So in the parlance of the local governance in the Philippines, you have development plans. And out of these plans, they provide allocation for activities that has been agreed upon for PHE activities. And this is where you'll be able to see uh, that they've allocated funds, whether it's um, small or big, the government is now able to provide funding to support some integrated activities um, at the provincial and the municipal uh, level. But again, this was all in the framework of poverty alleviation. Uh, we were able to mobilize uh, $70,000 from local partners for implementation of the integrated activities. And um, we established community-based systems in all the 22 municipalities, uh, coming up with a net network or training a network of close to 400 community-based systems, which is now established and now sustained by the LGU partners. And for same duration of time that we work with uh, with uh, IPOP form, although we had more, we were able to fast track and we were able to uh, meet some family planning and met needs in these areas. And they got their commodities through the community-based distribution points that was established by the project. Some of 
the other results we had for the project is that while we lack the resources to assess uh, the PPE's impacts on poverty indicators, uh, some of the feedback from the local government partners indicated improvements were in, as I've mentioned earlier, their income classification has moved up from, um, from classify, uh, from number five and number six classification of the local government to some reaching at least to number two, which means that um, there's more, more, um, there's more monies coming in, there's more generation, income generated by their constituencies within the local governments. While we cannot say for sure that it's really attributed <coughs> by the PPA project, um, the local partners have indicated that the project has somehow um, created an environment and created some activities that supported and helped them improve in terms of their income classification as a municipality. What this means for them is that if you have a higher classification in the local government, you're able to get higher revenue from the national government. So, and mostly uh, from, our, from our experience, those who have the lowest classification are usually from the most remote areas. And so it was, it was um, also a good, um, good outcome and something good that we, uh, although anecdotally, anecdotally, we heard from our partners in the field. Um, the LG also um, indicated um, improvement in the potential for ecotourism development and LG supported environmentally friendly enterprise development for the poor. Um, most of the areas were really um, uh, had, had um, si uh, very nice biodiversity areas where in most of the activities that they did, even for the, for the income generating activities was to promote ecotourism and the project being able to do um, the PH integration was able to help create within the community and promote uh, their ecotourism development as, as something that has uh, been contributed by the years of experience and wor years of working on the PH integration project. Some um, local governments have actually allocated uh, funds for livelihood um, initiatives for their poorest of the poor. Um, and as I've mentioned earlier, it is because the framework where we put in, in the investment plan, um, PPE activities was because it was on the framework of poverty alleviation, which is uh, the vision of the local government. What have we learned from the project that an LGU-centered uh, uh, model reach more women with unmet family planning need in a shorter time period than an NGO-centered PHE model. So we had a six-year program where in we learned a lot of things um, and we scaled it up uh, in a shorter time and reaching um, a significant number of areas and we were able to reach um, more women uh, with unmet need. Further monitoring is needed to determine which model is more sustainable. Um, the PPE just ended in 2010, so I think it, uh, it's worthwhile to look in terms of, uh, of uh, sustainability. Uh, because in the IPOC form, we had significant number, but with the change of leadership, every three years we have election, um, the sustainability is also in question. So, but putting it in, an, in a framework um, which is understandable and would be shared by even incoming leaders is something to really think of in terms of trying to get into the agenda of the local government and being able <coughs> to sustain gains by the project. IPOP Quorum uh, demonstrated a significant reduction in income poverty within six years, suggesting time frame required to assess PH impacts on poverty alleviation. Outside of this room, you'll see um, the paper that was recently um, published by the Environmental Conservation um, uh, Journal, and uh, you can have copies of that outside. It's actually uh, the results of the operations research that we did under the IPOPCORM project, which actually um, 
have a value added information about the results, positive results on um, on poverty alleviation and looking at income, particularly in adults, uh, in in um, in youth um, youth population. I mean, okay. So that's the IPOPCORM article uh, just outside, and uh, there's uh, <laughs> there's the link that we have, but hard copies are available outside. Um, I would have wanted to show you this, but I don't think we have time, and it seems to be not working when I tried it. Uh, it's actually a video showing of what uh, the government, how the government and talks about PHE in their own areas and trying to um, sell the PHE within their, within their peers or among their peers, like a uh, municipal development officer talking to the local governments to be able to integrate PHE in their own areas. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. I think that ends my presentation. Thank you all very much. The article that Joanne referred to uh, in Environmental Conservation, in fact, the co-author, Heather Diagnos is here along with Joanne, um, is, is very significant, I think, in part because of the paucity of results that we've talked about in terms of the challenge. Uh, the fact that it's in a peer-reviewed journal and such also brings it into uh, brings it to a different community that's ne um, less practitioner, more academic. Um, another key constituency that we need to have part of these discussions, and this is a critical step in uh, engaging that community as well as uh, the worlds of practice. Uh, so that's um, that's available outside, and we will have a variety of ways to get to that article from from the Wilson Center page, and I know the PA. PHE toolkit in a number of places you'll be able to, to get to it from there. Also, Joanne, we'll work with you to get a, a link to the video on the website with a review of this meeting so folks can find that nine-minute video there um, as well. So let's, uh, let's go to a discussion. Perhaps what we'll do is we'll collect a few questions and then give the panel an opportunity to respond. We have a lot of, uh, a lot of experience in the room here in the audience as well, and so uh, anticipate a lot of interesting questions in the conversation. So who would like to uh, kick off the discussion? We can start with Linda and then Kara, and then we'll go back. Uh, yeah, Lisa, at the end, sure. Okay. This question is for the Ethiopia team. Um, I know everybody's talking about how we need more funding for PHE, and I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, but we also have to look at partnering with groups, and I'm just wondering whether you have um, spoken to, linked with, mapped anything with, there's a lot of money in family planning in Ethiopia, there's a lot of aid money at least, I know, and I'm just wondering if you have been able to link some of those projects with existing pretty well-funded family planning projects in Ethiopia, and if so, you know, what has come out of that? Okay, thank you very much. Linda Bruce from Balance. Kara? This question is for Joanne. Um, I find your results really fascinating, and I think I come from the World Wildlife Fund, as you know, but we do these kinds of projects on the ground, too, and I'd like to um, get some more lessons from that, and I know you're in the early stages probably of still analyzing some of your results, but I'm, I'm wondering to what do you attribute the um, uh, being able to meet more unmet demand among women by working with the municipal governments. Um, did you, were you able to analyze that a little bit? And then uh, secondly, can you offer any other recommendations in the meantime about sustainability in relationship to working with the municipal governments in comparison to what you did under the iPopcorn project? Thank you. Okay, and Lisa Gaylord down at the end of the table. We'll take those three and then give you a chance to respond. And um, I'm introducing your, you now, but everybody please remember to introduce yourselves. Uh, Lisa Gaylord, I'm with Wildlife Conservation Society and have had a long experience also implementing HPE programs in Madagascar um, at the field level. And um, thank you both for your presentation. One of the things that I was really listening to is the kind of how the environment aspect is perceived 
both in the presentation in Ethiopia and in, in the Philippines, because I think that was always a challenge for us. Um, and I found it interesting in the Philippine presentation, um, you know, you talked about defining it in terms of an integral part of, um, you know, this need for food security enhances and ultimately improves the conservation objective while addressing the root cause of um, resource degradation. And, you know, so those are a lot of interlinked um, aspects that are trying to go back to the thread and trying to, to identify environment under that. And that's, of course, then where the livelihood piece comes in. And, um, you know, rather than it, obviously, the, I know that we've talked a little bit, I talked to Jeff about the acronym HPE, health, population, you have those as the dominant names, and environment was kind of all-encompassing. And we found that quite problematic um, in, in the Madagascar um, situation, because environment was everything, and then it wasn't really, you didn't have that nice linkage that I think you d that you've made in the, in the Philippines. So I guess I just wanted to ask about, um, both of you, kind of what has been your experience in kind of how environment was interpreted um, by the government, by the mun municipalities, and by the communities, and how they saw that linkage um, back in between the health um, and um, population. Okay, three good questions linking to existing family planning projects, some of the sustainability and results, the Philippines particularly, and then how to perceive the E and the challenges of the label. Who would like to uh, who would like to kick us off for responding? Nagash? Thank you. Uh, uh, first to what Linda is asking, uh, we, we are trying uh, to connect uh, conservation organizations uh, who are working on environment how they can coordinate their activity with those family planning organizations like reproductive health, uh, uh, gender health, Mary Stops, IPAS Ethiopia, Pathfinder, and in areas where their project site is matching with those conservation organizations. And it is working positively. Uh, they are the conservation organization, they deal with agricultural and uh, environmental related activity, then the health component, the family component is coming from those uh, pathfinder and others. And it is working positively. It's a good injection, but we cannot say it is uh, a big success, but we are trying on that line. And uh, for example, pathfinder has agreement to work on that in Bali Mountain, in Walaita Soddo area, uh, even uh, in Ambo area, there are projects that are being coordinated similarly. So it's a good direction and we'll maintain that. The other issue that was raised on the environment component, how is it being, how is it being taken in Ethiopia? Uh, we are approaching it in two ways. One, uh, the conservation organizations who were with the community working on environmental organization, they have realized uh, the importance of the health component, the social component in sustaining their project in their area because they have a big problem because of the population pressure. Uh, in their work. All protected area areas in Ethiopia are being threatened by population pressure. All forest areas are being uh, threatened by population pressure. So when they integrate the health package or the health component, they, have reali they are realizing how it is helping in uh, minimizing the pressure to their side. So, in fact, there is a clear understanding. Without having the family planning component, they cannot solve the protected area problems. So, because of this, even government, even the community in the area, they are really taking it seriously. In addition, there is a good environment in Ethiopia where we had a millennium uh, celebration and the main slogan was re-rehabilitating through planting 
the land, the degraded land. And it, it has become additional uh, input so that the environmental issue uh, integrated with health issues is the real solution. On the other hand, organizations who are working on family planning, some of them, they have stayed for 20, 30 years, 10 years, but if you go and assess their impact, it's not that much because they were not integrating their approach with livelihood issues of the community, environmental issue, agricultural issue of the community. The community. Once they start <coughs> integrating that, they have realized the community is buying in, is taking it seriously more than ever. So there is a good buy-in because of the integration. So that way, uh, bringing the linkage is working positively, I could say, in Ethiopia. That is what I can share. I'm just going to add to what Nagash said, but I'll be quick because I know we want to hear from the Philippines as well. Um, to respond to Linda's question, I know that um, Nagash mentioned Pathfinder in the Bali Mountains, and Melka Ethiopia was talking with Pathfinder to try and integrate some of their work together to try and achieve some, to leverage some of those USAID resources happening in the Bali region. And Melka was having challenges trying to get funding for that, their part of the project. So, but that's definitely been, those conversations are going on. And other linkages are trying to be made, like Nagash said, but that's the most tangible one I can, I can um, show you or tell you about. Um, and for Lisa, in terms of how environment is perceived, I think that looking at 80% at of Ethiopia's population relies on subsistence agriculture. And so we're looking at most all of the PAG projects are coming from a livelihood perspective, and that's really how the communities are perceiving the environment. They need to protect it, they need to re rehabilitate it for livelihood reasons. I think the only project that might that comes from a different perspective would be Melka Ethiopia in terms of environmental protection because the Bali Mountains is a very biodiverse region with a lot of um, really interesting animal species and um, plant species up there, and it's a whole other eco-region within um, the, the country. And one other piece I want to add really quickly is that I found conversations interesting um, because when I was talking with health organizations, even within the Packard office, because it was a reproductive health and program and reproductive health and family planning program, they always said, "Oh, the PHE projects are the environment projects." And then if you talk to the health folks, they're like, "Oh, the, or, or, sorry." If you talk to the um, to the environment folks, they're like, "Oh, the PHE projects are the health projects." And so depending on who I was talking to, I was the health expert or the environment expert. <laughs> and so it's, it's a really tough issue to kind of figure out where, where you fit. And so it's and also having those discussions and trying to make, try, trying to really communicate the equal part population health and environment. I respond to Kara's question first on um, attributing the unmet need for women, reaching unmet need. There's a lot of factors that come into it. I think one of the most important factor is the site selection. As I've described earlier, the sites where we worked in were really from the lowest classification, income classification. So it matters to them that the service delivery is now being, um, the accessibility to the service delivery is, um, is within their reach. So um, that's one. The other one is also, um, uh, these are the most deprived. Uh, so they haven't seen, a lot of them haven't seen um, services go to them in, in, in for the most part of, of, uh, of um, their life. So because most of the projects are usually in, in center areas, in central areas, but this one, you have to take a boat even. So looking at, looking at areas, accessibility is one, and we are, um, we, you know, we have island communities that we need to work in, and so getting commodities even to the islands um, is a challenge to us. Um, one thing that I can attribute this is also we work, we have established already working with sites in the IPOPCORM. So we continued to work with them. So if you look at the areas that we work in, we have not really left those areas. We maintained some of them, so we were continuing to, uh, to reap 
what we have sold in the first six years, but then scaling up to cover more villages. So we, if we work in the IPOP Quorum for two villages or five villages, and a municipality in our, our area would consist of like up to 50 villages. So you are now able to reach a wider area, but now it has facilitated because they see results in the two areas. And now you get, because there are better results, the local government is more supportive in terms of even advocating for the work that you did uh, initially. So those are things that, um, that I can say have, are key that contributed. And there are a lot of factors uh, that come with it. Um, recommendations for sustainability with, in relation to LGU uh, is still really learning the local governance system. So that's actually the challenge when you work in new areas. If you don't understand the political system, you have to have that learning curve to be able to understand where who are your potential allies? How many, who should you work with? So you cannot work with only the chief, local chief executives. What we have learned from this project is that you have to have a lot of champions from the provincial government to the local government, <laughs> national at the subnational. You have champions at the village level who will actually have a stand in terms of, of being able to um, sustain the project. So. That can be the beauty of a decentralized government like we have, um, but you have to do a lot of work. You have to learn a lot of things. You have to meet a lot of people. You have to create a lot of, of, um, of PHE leaders and champions. Um, and it's the numbers that actually come together at the end of the project. So um, being critical, um, learning learning all the systems. I, I still feel that in the PHE project, learning the whole governance system, when do they put their budget in, what are, who are the groups that compose the development councils, is there a development council at the village level, is there a development council at the municipal level, um, where does this take you, and, and um, it comes all together, like even very little amount, if you have many villages, it comes out to be big numbers uh, in the end. Um, so it's not new, but it's more learning the ropes, uh, uh, of the of the area that you work in environment how in terms of the question for a question of lisa on how environment is perceived um it's a per, it's perceived as a key because in fact the family planning and rep reproductive health component um, should be advocated as essential or connected to natural resource management so the presence from our experience working in key biodiversity areas, like um, put some pride in the community and uh, the local government to have a contribution in any way there is. It, is it policy? Is it money? Is it awareness? That puts all these efforts together. So for example, why is it that a lot of people, uh, why is it that the government in the Verde Island, which is the center of species uh, uh, speciation in the world for marine life is um, gets a lot of support it's because you have to put in also um, a lot of efforts to advocate how important that biodiversity or that region is and that if you do family planning if you integrate health if you integrate population then it contributes to taking care of of that whole um, area so that's that's how um, the community perceives it. Um, at the individual level, they'd see it as more food or l for, for the future of their children. So we work at different levels, depends on the vision. You know, there's a vision of the local government. We need to understand that. At the level of the community and the household, they would see it differently. So it's not programmatic, but what is it to them? Is it sending their children in the future. If they take care of their environment, then there's fish for them and may be able to have uh, um, more income for the family so that they can have a better life for their children. So um, that's from our experience. Terrific, thank you, Joanne. There's a question we ended with at the back of the room. Oh boy, we got a lot. We're gonna have to, we'll get, a, we'll get you and then we'll all have to be quick in doing it. Go ahead. Very quickly, my name is Priya Amat. I'm from Futures Group, and this question is for Ethiopia. 
Um, my question is, um, the Ethiopia approach seems to be, you know, more um, uh, demand side, a demand side approach as opposed to the Philippines, which is a sort of combination demand supply side. And what I wanted to know is how interested is the Ministry of Health in that kind of approach and, and USAID Ethiopia, for example, because uh, until fairly recently, the way they've approached it is really to bring, you know, commodities services closer to the community level and um, what you're trying to suggest is that advocacy information you're creating demand so I just wondered how interested they were and I have a very quick question about land registration and do you think that has also maybe increased interest in a PHE approach okay, Kaylin if you could bring it down to Ed down here and Kaylee could you give it to John and and uh, Salim, well, Salim jumps in here. Where do you come from? Okay. Go ahead. Grab those folks there. Right, right. Go ahead. Yep. Salim has a question oh, right there. All yep. right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm Salim Ali. I'm a professor at the University of Vermont. Um, and my question is regarding the Islamic uh, connection in Ethiopia, which was mentioned. I'm originally from Pakistan, and I've done some work on environmental education issues in uh, madrasas and Islamic religious schools. And that's one of the most imponderable issues with regard to population control in the Muslim world is this, uh, you know, the, the Islamic um, imperative for procreation and so on. So h how were you able to convince the imams in this way, and especially with a Christian organization, I mean, it would be unthinkable in Pakistan, you know. It, so it, it's so intriguing and bewildering for me how you were able to accomplish it. And also in the Philippines, have have you explored the potential for this in Mindanao and the, the Muslim areas there? Okay. Ed? Um, hi, Ed Carr, uh, Dacha Bureau Climate Change Coordinator, USAID. Um, I actually want to follow up on Lisa's point because I thought you all sort of answered her question, but I'm not sure we actually got to the heart of it. All of you said that, you know, the environment is integral. Everyone raised that. But one of the biggest challenges in this kind of programming is thinking about the actual connections between population health and environmental outcomes. And actually, the literature on this is pretty tortured. Um, there is not a clear relationship between these things. The literature comes down at the end on the, well, it depends on where you are, which is great for geographers like me because it gives us a reason to exist. But um, I'm wondering how you all, because there's a lot of assumptions in a lot of cases about what happens. More population equals more degradation, but that doesn't actually play out necessarily. So I'm wondering if some of the assumptions behind what you guys were doing in terms of programming or interpretation, you actually were able to empirically verify, or if that's something that actually still needs to sort of be followed up on. Okay, why don't we get a couple more, because we had so many. Where were some other hands? Jason down here and John. Okay, the John's got the microphone. Go ahead. Then we'll get you guys down here. I'll, I'll be very quick because I think what you've done is start a very interesting conversation. There's lots of questions laying around. Obviously, these projects, from what I can tell, are very good and very interesting. But I want to know what they add up to uh, because most of the experience of other countries that have done well over the period of time is they've got strong governments that are committed to development. And my sense is in both of these cases, that's not altogether true by a considerable amount. Secondly, how much of this, uh, and I'm asking this particularly of Anne, is a donor problem? Uh, my sense is that you ran down through these various layers of organizations passing money down. A lot of it must get soaked up. I don't mean by corruption. I just mean by overheads and everything else. And uh, would it be much easier for people on the ground to be more effective uh, if there was a lot better donor behavior? And that includes, by the way, foundations as well as official agencies. Okay, why don't we get uh, Jason Mora down here. I know this is a lot, but we want to make sure everyone gets a chance to have a word in here. Thank you, uh, Jason Renner, PRB. You all talked, again, coming back to the environmental perspective, <clears throat> you talked about the results of, of various projects, and I seem to hear over and over reports of health impacts, contraceptive prevalence rates, and a couple of things on improved livelihoods, perhaps, didn't hear much uh, in terms of Melka on an actual environmental impact. And at the same time, uh, those in the, in the advocacy community and, and myself as well are talking about <clears throat> these integrated projects being perhaps an example for community-based adaptation projects, which obviously would be talking about environmental or uh, livelihood impacts that improve people's resilience. So I guess my question is, what kind of environmental 
impacts are we seeing that we can then really say, that, you know, uh, with clear empirical results, um, make this climate adaptation connection? Um, and I think it's, is it that they're just too long term or we need to do a better job of measuring them or we need to just do a better job of communicating them? Okay, then we'll get the final quick. If you could just pass it across, Jason. Was there, was there a question there? Okay. Thanks. Hi, I'm Kathleen Mogelgaard with Population Action International, and this question may feed off of a number a number of the other responses to the questions that we've had just recently. But Annie, my question is specifically targeted at one of the recommendations that you had for the donor community, and and that was to support programs that have a research component. And I wondered if you could unpack that a little bit more to share with us some of your thoughts on the kinds of research questions that could be investigated beyond the traditional monitoring and evaluation that could help strengthen PHE programs and advance them. Thanks. Okay, I realize that oh, do we got, I think we got them all. That was six questions. That's a lot, I know. But I figure you can divide and conquer, so you can pick and choose. Um, it gives you a way to skirt the ones that are really tough. But uh, we'll try to hold your feet to the fire. Who would like to, who would like to uh, start us off? Annie, sure. So, uh, Priya, <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I, I started losing names, so I'm gonna have to start pointing at near the end of my responses, I'm, I apologize. Um, so you're asking about demand, the demand side approach and that, um, and how the Ministry of Health right now is more focusing on a supply side approach and how they're buy, what they're buying is for this approach. And I didn't get to go into all the detail of all the, all of the different interventions, but um, LEM Ethiopia and Gypsy Doe are bringing commodities into the communities, and both of those organizations did, were, were reporting on indicators of lack of long-term long um, method supply and how that was hindering and affecting their um, ability to do outreach on um, family planning methods. So there is some, some supply side in these projects, but definitely they are, most of the projects are on a demand side. And the Ministry of Health has, is interested in continuing the demand side um, in the sense that, I mean, they're supporting the projects, they're allowing the health extension workers to, to be involved in this integrated, these integrated approaches, but um, definitely I just wanted to quote some of the projects and what they're doing on the commodity side, but definitely, I, I think that Nagash will probably go a little bit more on the Ministry of Health piece. Um, and then the question on how we're able to convince the moms to buy into um, the, um, the family planning and contraception, and it really came down to connecting it to livelihoods and health and the well-being of the community of the families. And I mean, they were very clear. We, there's quotes in the reports that say, "But abortion does not." is not an option here. We're just talking about in, to benefit the health and livelihood and well-being of a family and the mother, we need to protect our mothers and our women. So it's okay to use family planning for these reasons. And so that's, those are what the quotes were saying. And I, I'm not going to claim to be a, a very, know a lot about the Islamic religion, but I know that that's what the Islamic leaders were saying. And actually Melka Ethiopia isn't a designated Christian organization. The, the, it's not with the CCRDA. And they actually do have some, I mean, I, I know that they have some Muslims on staff I don't know if all everybody's Muslim. Um, it wasn't something that we talked about often. Um, I hope that that answers your question. Yeah, I mean the main issue is usually you know the, the argument is made well. Mm. You know you need um, more children to sort of have a demographic kind of a uh, you know ma majority and the political power and so on, and that's the real challenge often. And so I guess that's not an issue where you are. Well, and the health and well-being of the mother was an issue, so spacing your births, and so using family planning to space the births, but definitely, I mean, they weren't saying only have two kids, they were just saying using family planning to help with the health and well-being of the family. Did you want to yeah, add to that? Yeah. Uh, if you see this uh, spotlight, it addresses about Bali area, where the Muslims are within the Bali uh, biosphere area. So the religious leaders are being part of the PHA approach because they have realized spacing the birth rate and uh, participation of the women, it is positively attracting them and they are endorsing it. Even they are saying in our Quran it doesn't say do this, don't do this, in relation to family planning. So uh, they don't have the trait of the Christian in that area. Their question is how to manage their life. 
now that the main issue that comes to their mind is how to exist. Nothing that can make them frightened so that they have more children. Bali area, their area is almost a Muslim area. So because of this, it would, I would advise to read it. Uh, it will give you some hint. Uh, in relation, have you finished? No, I'm go ahead. Finished. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. There was a question about how much of the recommendations are a result of the uh, donor problem. And um, I think that definitely a lot of the, uh, the projects and the lack of monitoring and evaluation is definitely because there isn't, there, a lot of work is donor driven, whether we like it or not, it is. And if we're not asking, if the donors aren't asking for certain indicators to be reported on or funding monitoring and evaluation or encouraging capacity building a really long or, or, or good amount of time for planning, um, I think that it is an issue. And it's def that was definitely a recommendation that came in, in the report is saying this is, this is a role that a donors could play. This is a role that specifically the Packard Foundation can play. So I do think that there, the, the donors definitely play a huge role in how um, the capacity building and the monitoring and evaluation issues are uh, these rec where these recommendations came from. Um, supporting programs that have a research component. Um, and a research question. Well, you know, I actually had a discussion about this yesterday and we were talking about maybe it would be better to do a qualitative assessment and go out and just do, ask some questions with communities. Why, what, where, where do they think, see the linkages? Why do they think that there are better parent-child communications? Is it be, and are they going to be quoting some of the PHE integrated activities? Um, what, you know, for me, I think a question is, and I know this is a really broad question, but what is the PHE, how does the PHE approach in Ethiopia affecting a household's livelihood? And I know that that would be really hard to, to figure out, but I mean really breaking that down and seeing how we can look at what, are these linkages and all of these results that are being reported, are they really connected to PHE or are there other factors? Um, and I think that, you know, whether it's a, it's a structured, um, research with a, with, with, with a research question or even getting into um, designing projects based on research or is it really trying to encourage more monitoring and evaluation or going in and doing some assessments of all of Packard, found, a formal assessment of the Packard Foundation projects or going in and doing some qualitative assessments. I mean, I think that any of that would be useful. Any results coming out of Ethiopia beyond just some, some of the qualitative work that I did talking with folks would be really useful. Um, Jason, what did I say? You're reporting on health and livelihood and what kind of environmental impacts. So we're continuing on how really what's going on with the environment. And I would say with the Packer projects, I mean, the focus is, is on, on reproductive health. Um, and they're not being asked to report on the environment. They're at being asked to report on the reproductive health and family planning. But if you talk to the organizations, they can tell you what, what their opinions are. I mean, I know Melka is measuring <coughs> their, how they feel that the environmental protection activities and the rehabilitation activities that the Senyi groups are doing, the youth clubs are doing, then um, you can get that, that information. Um, but I do think that there is a gap in how to how to measure the environmental impact of the projects, um, especially when you're working with organizations that have been focusing on reproductive health and family planning. Um, so there needs to be more, more focus on that, but then also a lot of them are saying it takes a long time to look at how this is really impacting. I mean, they can talk about well, this is how many acres we were able to um, protect or re we're working on rehabilitating um, or hectares, how, how many we're, we're working on rehabilitating, but um, they're not able to say they have been re rehabilitated or we, you know, we've planted this many trees and we're, and we're maintaining the seedlings or, you know, th that's, those are the kinds of things or the nurseries that they're working on. Those are the kinds of things that they're reporting on right now. It's a lot of its process right now. Just to add uh, to what uh, Annie is <coughs> saying, you know, if you compare the strengths of uh, NGOs who are working on family planning and the environment. The family planning organizations are very strong with enough funds even that could deal with the indicators, the monitoring and the evaluation when compared to environment. So uh, one thing is the intervention we have in country when you compare family, the reproductive health and environment is 
there is a big gap. Secondly, you know, uh, environmental things need time to see change. Uh, you can't identify it easily. That is another uh, reason. But if you ask or you can identify, uh, for example, uh, Rift Valley area, people tell you openly how the degradation, degradation and deforestation of the land is contributing in making the beautiful lakes we have in the Rift Valley, they are becoming shallow. Uh, boat owners, uh, all visitors, they can realize how the lakes are becoming shallow. Even you can see the Rift Valley area, it is almost open because of the deforestation. And people tell you, we had so many springs coming from this mountain, but we no more see them. So the impact is clear uh, from your eye. You can see them. At the same time, when you do positively uh, in rehabilitating their land, you can see how springs that have died, rehabilitated, and come again. Take, for example, you have visited with Heather the Witchland. It was a playground, that wetland area. Now it has uh, enough water, enough grass. Uh, people are using it even in drought time. Other woredas are migrating to other places, but that woreda where the wetland is rehabilitated, no more migrating. You can see, if you do positively, you can rehabilitate easily. We have seen lakes like Alam, uh, Alamaya. It is lost, but... In Tigray, for example, uh, there is a big campaign to, through the closure system to rehabilitate the land. We can see green. Uh, for example, I have visited uh, my native place. It was dry, but now, after rehabilitating it, it is green. Wild animals is all coming. So if you work strongly, you can change it. As the family planning indicators, uh, we may lack them. That is one area we need as PHE family to strengthen how we can develop the environmental and other indicators in a way we can share the information and use it for our advocacy. In relation to Ministry of Health, uh, by the way, the PHE approach we have in country if it was not the Ministry of Health's uh, health extension package that had 16 components, including uh, family planning components like maternal mortality, child mortality, anything related, uh, in addition, environmental health, the 16 components, where they have around 30,000 health extension workers that were trained, and we get them in every cavalry. Tutu. Without their support, our integration approach wouldn't have been success. It is the support of Ministry of Health on the ground through their health extension workers that we are able to establish our PHA approach anywhere. In the projects Annie addressed, it is the health, health, health extension workers that are contributing highly. In addition, the DA, the development agent workers, we have three in addition from agriculture and the environment. So our integration approach is working on the ground through the paid staff of the government, two from the health extension workers, three from agriculture and environment, five of them. If they start integrating, then the integration is happening. Uh, in addition, what can we do? to attract them to the PHE approach, well, it needs more advocacy work. They are coming, they are on the pipeline, but it needs more work. Uh, USAID, they know uh, about our development, they are informed, we have connection, but up to now, we are not getting any direct support from USAID mission. 
apart from our yes and Washington support. Uh, w there were some calls that were advertised. We applied, but we were not successful. Maybe they are not still uh, in uh, highly co interested in buying them. So it needs us more advocacy work. You people around, uh, if you have any interest in Ethiopia, in pushing them, and we in country showing them success stories that could attract them on the ground. And we are planning to have some visit to our site with the environment and health uh, leaders in the mission sometime in February. I'm sure in the future they will come and maybe balance PRB and the others who have project PAI, you may push still to show them that investing in the PH approach will be uh, a good plus. In relation to land uh, registration, yes, it has positive impact because you are secure that the land is yours. Once you are secure that you will do big investment, so it has contribution. Uh, there is a big mobilization that rehabilitating the land, be it yours or of public ownership, it will benefit you. But the land certification is additional value that uh, clears your uh, concern or uh, questions, is it going to be mine to the other? So, yes, it is contributing positively. Joanne, final word? Yeah, I'll, I'll keep this brief, but the questions were very interesting. Uh, empirical evidence for PHE links. I think we have at least one document right off, uh, which is available on the table. Please uh, um, get a copy, but also it encourages us to do more research, to look into the other perspectives of the PHE links. But what I can say as a practitioner in the field is that the community and the people say their lives are linked, and so the solution should be linked. And that's that's out of uh, from their mouth. So they, when we talk about integration, they say, "What are you talking about? We're already integrated. Our issues are integrated. So we need an integrated link." So they don't need the empirical evidence to be able to show that. I think that uh, speaks the life that they live is uh, speaks of the integration. Secondly, I'd like to respond, he's not here anymore, but how do uh, PHE, how do they all add up to? I think we have to look at this at the different levels, um, at the individual level. And I can say this in terms of our experience in the Philippines, because geographically we started small, and I think we have now the biggest PHE project um, uh, modesty aside uh, <laughs> in the world. <laughs> um, and I say that because we have recently also got a buy-in from the Philippines mission. So that is actually very encouraging to see other sectors now coming into play in addition to the environment project that the government is now putting more funds to um, do PHE linkage us or adapting the PHE as now uh, a way to address the issues that they had. So I can say that um, it's all adding up. It takes time. It takes a lot of effort and advocacy. And I think there's a lot of discussion that we need to uh, be involved in at the national and at the international level. And with that, I would like to invite you to the national conference in, in February in the Philippines. It's the fourth, fourth PHE national conference, Ma uh, February 28 to March 1. And we would like to continue that discussion also there, what we have started here. And, um, and please, uh, l the commitment and the advocacy for PHE uh, has to be be always there, otherwise there's nothing that will add up to. So uh, it is impacting in the lives of people that we reach, I think, with uh, um, women that, that has accepted family planning, men and women who are now part of the conservation activities in, in at least the places that we work in. Um, he's not there also, but we work in the in the Mindanao area with is Islam, I think the framework is important. There is a fatwa uh, actually in Muslim Mindanao where we had to work 
uh, with because uh, they have the highest population growth rate, higher than the national, double than the national average. So, um, PHE transcends religion. I think that's the message I, 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 we experience from this field. The, the community-based system working at the household level um, will have different impacts, um, differently both environment and, and, uh, and, and family planning. Terrific. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, we're 11 over. <laughs> um, so um, I will urge you all to come talk to Nagash about Cancun and, and climate, and perhaps we'll, we'll get you to write something down, put it on the blog, have, come, have you come back, because critically important. But I'm afraid we have, um, we have tested the patience of our audience here lo long enough, and we'll give you a chance to come, come up and talk after. Uh, thank you, all three of you, for a terrific um, a set of presentations. Thank you for some excellent and tough and probing questions from the audience. Um, please do pick up the publications outside, both the article on the IPOP quorum case, uh, Annie's piece on the assessment of the Packard pro projects in Ethiopia, as well as the focus briefs that uh, give you a range of population health environment uh, experiences from around the world, including the Philippines and including Ethiopia. Uh, so please join me in thanking our panelists for a wonderful session. <laughs>